Hi, I'm Scott, one of the pastors here at Branch Life Church. Thank you for engaging with us today in this digital platform. We're excited to worship with you. We trust that you'll be encouraged and challenged with God's word. We would invite you to let us know how you're processing and what, how we can pray for you through our connection card, which is always available at branchlife.church. If you would like to make giving part of your worship experience today, you can do that at the website as well. The address is branchlife.church slash give. Thanks again for connecting. We look forward to hearing from you and we trust that God will use this time in your life.
Hi, welcome to week two of our series, Follow the Leader. And follow is kind of a funny word. We use it in a lot of different ways that, that you may not actually realize. And, and we think about all the ways that, that we might use the word follow. We follow people on social media. So I follow friends from college to see what's going on with them and with their families and now with their kids and we won't talk about how old the kids are getting because uh, I'm certainly not that old. We follow sports teams. Uh, some of you know, much to your chagrin, that I follow the Ohio State Buckeyes. And so that means I'm a fan of their teams, especially their football and basketball teams and enjoy watching them on TV. We follow news and the news events. And so a couple of weeks ago, there was a great tragedy in Florida with the collapsing of the, the high rise apartment building. And so we're following the developments on that. We're following first the rescue efforts and now the, the, the uh, rebuilding or the, the, the cleanup of that uh, event. Uh, then there's events, kind of big events that we might follow. So another thing about me is I like to follow the Tour of France, and it's on my bucket list one day to go to France for those three weeks in late June and July to, to watch the Tour of France and to travel to all of the different sites and watch the event and the cyclists go up and down the mountains and, and across the streets and the, the plains of France. And so we watch events, we follow events. As we might follow in our parents' footsteps, follow in our dad or our mom's footsteps. My dad was a pastor, I'm a pastor. I'm following in his footsteps. And then we, we follow the evidence to, to figure out mysteries. So when I come home and the, something has happened in the house, I follow the evidence to figure out which of my kids has made this unexpected surprise for me to come in. And, and I follow where it leads me. So it's following data or the circumstances of that. What of these definitions of follow uh, has to do with our idea of following the leader. Which of it has to do with following the leader? Really, none of these are great definitions when we're talking about following Jesus. We certainly don't follow Jesus like on social media and just kind of see what he's doing. Uh, we're not just fans of Jesus, although it's certainly great and commendable to be a fan of Jesus. We're, we're not trying to keep up with all the theological developments, and so some new theologian figures out some new way of looking at Jesus' words in the scriptures or something like that, and so we're just kind of intellectually intrigued, or some archaeologist finds some site that, that has some artifact, and so then we get all excited, and, and that it's fine, but that's not what we're talking about. It's not just like some event that we go to, whether it's church on Sunday or whether it's some big conference that we'd go to hear some famous preacher and have him tell us about Jesus and, and we look forward to that. That's, that's not what we're talking about when we follow Jesus. Uh, and it's, it's not just evidence, like we're not just looking to evidence for Jesus as from Jesus to, to show us God, uh, maybe the, the best definition or the closest is that idea of, of following in Jesus' footsteps, of, of following after like we might our parents. But, but even that is not quite uh, the, the emphasis that, that we're talking about when we talk about following Jesus. It's not just, hey, Jesus was nice to poor people, so I'm going to be nice to poor people. It's, it's more than that. We want to know the mind of Christ, to have his attitudes and his perspective form in our life. It's not just the actions or our jobs or what we do. It's becoming all of, like, of what Jesus is. In one of the most convicting verses in the Bible, at least for me, 
that talks about this. It, it kind of picks up on this idea of following in his footsteps a little bit, but then takes it that extra step to be all encompassing. And in 1 John chapter 2, verse 6, it says, whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. That's a huge challenge and a huge charge. That is our aim, that we would walk just as Jesus walked. And so as we work our way through these chapters in Matthew and we're thinking about how we can follow the leader, how we can follow Jesus, we're learning how we should become just like him. And we're going to focus on one particular area of that this week. We're going to think of this idea that we're going to follow Jesus, which means we focus on others. We follow Jesus, focus on others. And we're going to see this from, from Matthew chapter 8, verses 14 through 22. It's kind of the next two sections in this account that we're working through in chapters 8 through 11. So let's jump in and see what it is to follow Jesus and, and why that should produce in us this focus on other people. The first two verses say this, when Jesus entered Peter's house, he saw his mother-in-law lying sick with a fever. He touched her hand and the fever left her and she rose and began to serve him. Now I'll let you insert your own mother-in-law joke here. I don't have any mother-in-law jokes. I have a great mother-in-law. You can all tell her I said that. But uh, we see here that Jesus entered into this house. It might have been a frequent stop for Jesus and his disciples as they traveled throughout Israel and the countryside and ministered to people. But they came in and Peter's mother-in-law was sick. And the first thing that, that we notice there is that Jesus saw his mother-in-law. He noticed her. In Matthew's gospel, the focus of this account is on the fact that Jesus took all the initiative. The remarkable thing about Jesus is, although he had a divine purpose, he was God in flesh himself. And every step that he took, everything he did was towards a specific ends that never prevented him from seeing the, the needs of the people around him. He came into this home and he saw that Peter's mother-in-law was sick. Do we see the needs in people around us? I'm not just talking about like the big needs that we might all acknowledge of, of poverty, of hunger, of disease, of, of warfare and, and distress in that. But do we see the, the simple everyday needs of the people in our life, in the people in our neighborhood, in the people that are our coworkers? Are we concerned when we haven't seen our neighbor for a few days and, and, and do we check in on them? When the mom is bringing in a whole new load of groceries, do we see that? Do we notice that that's a need and that she might need help to bring it in? My neighbors thankfully saw a need that we had on our life. We recently went on vacation and we left the garage door open when we left. And they called us and they said, hey, did you mean to do this? I don't think you did. But, and we said, oh, no, 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 we didn't do that. And one of our neighbors had taken the initiative and, and figured out how to close our garage door. And they were letting us know that they took care of this need in our life. Do we see the needs in people's lives? Or are we too busy? Uh, we uh, should never let the conventions, the social conventions, then stop us from acting. Uh, in, our, in our verse, we'll go back and look at it. It says that he touched her hand and the fever left her. There were kind of some weird dynamics and, and that, and it's, it's not all that different from today. It would be weird if I went around, started touching people's mothers-in-law and, and that, you know, there's, but there was, especially in that day, it was kind of something that you didn't do. You were very careful and that with, with, 
with women and, and, and there was a, a sense in which they were looked down on and, and all of these things. But Jesus didn't let the social convention stop him from acting. He went ahead and acted. It's one thing to see the needs of around us. It's another thing then to step up and act. Do we enter in? Do we ask the questions and then seek to provide the needs as much as we're able to? I hope, and it's one of the challenges that, for the, that I have for you this week, that, that you will take time to see the needs and then to step in and act. Jesus focusing on other people started here with Peter's mother-in-law, but he was only getting started in what seems to be a very busy day of ministry to others for Jesus. The next section of verses, the next verse says, that evening they brought to him many that were oppressed by demons and he cast out the spirits with a word and he healed all who were sick. We won't go in too much to this idea of demons and, and the spiritual realms and all of that this week. In a couple of uh, sessions or sermons from now, there will be an extended passage on that, that that we'll dive into that a little bit more. But let me just say while we're here that, that the spiritual world is real. There are such things as angels and demons there are evil spirits that, that may attempt to harm people or to oppress them, as this verse talks about. And that there is a connection sometimes between the spiritual and the physical. If we think about the spiritual realm, we don't really too often think about the connection that it might have with the, the physical. It's, it's something otherworldly. It's something that doesn't impact our day-to-day -day lives. But here we see that in some circumstances, physical harm might be the result of spiritual oppression. That's not all the time. That's not every circumstance. But it is a reality. And I think what Matthew is doing in this passage and in this, he's kind of laying out and what Pastor Josh spoke of in our previous message and, and here, we're seeing that Jesus focusing on other people is a focus on the marginalized, the oppressed, those that we would typically stay away from. You think about the, the first account in Matthew chapter 8, and it talks about Jesus healing the leper. Here was someone, because of his ceremonial uncleanness and because of being contagious himself or herself, was separated and couldn't be around family and friends and be a normal part of society. Jesus stepped in and met that need. Then there was a centurion, a Roman soldier. Again, someone who was like an enemy to the Jewish people, someone who was on the outside. And Jesus stepped in and healed that man's servant. Then we have a woman who we talked about and, and, and Peter's mother-in-law and, and Women were not exactly on the, the height of culture and, and society, and they kind of had a secondary place. And here, certainly, demon-oppressed and spiritually-oppressed people were not those that you'd say, hey, look, Mom, who I brought home for dinner. They were people that were isolated and outside. Jesus focused on the marginalized, the disenfranchised, those who are, are poor and needy. And when we focus on others, when we follow Jesus and focus on others, we need to make sure that we're giving special attention to those types of people. The Bible elsewhere kind of talks about the reality of that if we do things nice for people that can return it for us, like everybody pretty much does that. But when we focus on those that are less fortunate, that is truly what Jesus had in mind. And so when we focus on others, we want to emphasize the marginalized. We want to pay special attention to that. We strive to do that here at Branch Life and we get involved with things. We've become especially involved in, in providing food and, and involved in some outreaches regarding food in our community and area. 
And this is the type of thing that we do. But let's not let kind of our corporate participation in that let us kind of off the hook individually. And let us remember that, that both as a church as a whole and us as individuals, we need to emphasize the marginalized when we talk about being focused on others. The next section of, of Scripture kind of starts a new section, but I really think that these two parts work really well together. And it kind of helps us know when we focus on others, kind of the realities of what that looks like. Let's see what, what happens here in the text. It says, now when Jesus saw a crowd around him, he gave orders to go over to the other side. So again, Jesus is assembling people around him. People have come to, to hear him and, and that. And it says, a scribe came up and said to him, teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. Here's this, this scribe, kind of a, an expert in, in the law and knowing things. And, and he's evidently because of Jesus teaching and then the miracles, he thinks, hey, this might be a good idea that, that I link up and hook up with Jesus. Some commentators think that this phrase, I will follow you wherever you go, is kind of the idea of, hey, Jesus, I'm about to make your day. It's your lucky day. I am going to follow you. And kind of a, a prideful sort of way. Whatever the motivations of this man, Jesus wanted to make sure that he understood the reality. Because I think Jesus saw into his heart and knew that something was, else was going on there. And he says, listen, if you're going to follow me, you're not going to have a place to stay. Your comforts aren't going to be taken care of. This is going to be something that's going to require self-sacrifice. And if you're just in it for self-advancement and for your own good, you're missing this. Following Jesus is about focusing on others, even when that means we give up our own comforts. And then he emphasizes this by saying, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. Now, this son of man is Jesus' most popular way of referring to himself in all of the Gospels. And there's several Old Testament passages that, that use this terminology. But I think one of them that, that has in mind and is primary in this text is in Daniel chapter 7. And you can look at it at your own time, but it's this prophetic passage where Jesus, where God the Father is called the Ancient of Days, and he's handing off to the Son of Man, Jesus, this uh, authority and dominion over the kingdoms of the world. And it's this prophecy of in the future when Jesus will be king over all of the kingdoms of the earth. And Jesus says, hey, listen, I, the Son of Man, don't even get special privileges or, or, or creature comforts when we're focusing on others. When we follow Jesus and focus on others, we need to remember that our comfort is secondary. Focusing on others means that our comfort is secondary. Jesus, the Son of Man, the prophesied king of all of creation. And we're learning all of these things in Matthew about how Jesus is the king and has authority and is the prophesied one and all of these things. He did not have comforts. He did not have a place to lay his head. He traveled and had to rely on the, the hospitality of others and, and probably slept outside a lot of times and all of these different things. It was not a comfortable existence for him. His comfort is secondary when we focus on others. The next part of this then continues on and it says another of the disciples. So here another person that's kind of been checking Jesus out. Um, probably not one of like the, the 12 main disciples or that, but, but somebody that's been following him for a little bit said to him, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, follow me. And leave the dead to bury their own dead. Here again, we see the emphasis on following Jesus. And focusing on others outside of that. 
And the, the idea here is that focusing on others means our desires are secondary. Focusing on others means our desires are secondary. What we want to do is not always the most important. We might say to Jesus or to God and, and that maybe we don't, are not brave enough to verbalize it out loud, but in our minds and in our hearts, we might say something like, Jesus, I'll follow you, but I need to, to get to a certain point in my career. Jesus, I'll follow you, but you know, my, my kids are young and there's so much going on and I've got to take them to there and to there and in a little bit. Jesus, I'll, I'll follow you, but, but I, I don't have the, the, the material resources, the money saved up quite yet to make sure that I'm secure in, in all of that. And so I'm going to take care of that circumstance. Jesus, I'll, I'll follow you and I'm ready to go all in, but I'm not quite sure that my, my spouse or my close family in that is, is quite as on board as I am. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wait until that happens. Our desires are secondary. Uh, Jesus is reminding this disciple, and he says, listen, hey, taking care of your family, honoring your father and doing all that, we have no idea if the father is already dead, if he's near to death, or if he's just got a terminal illness that's going to last for who knows how long. But we have to remember that, that our desires are secondary to following Jesus. It's kind of an all-in type of arrangement. We're talking about and communicating this idea that following Jesus means that we focus on others. We need to, to see the needs around us. We need to, to act on those needs, even if it means that our comfort and our desires are secondary. When we really start to think about and to contemplate doing this and to try to put this into action, we realize very quickly that it's, a, it's an impossible task to do on our own. We, we don't naturally see the needs around us. We get tunnel vision into to what's happening. Uh, the, there's needs that, that come up and, and we know and maybe I should do something, but the, the kids just ran off and I've got to go look and then the moment's gone and, and we missed it. We don't naturally do this. And then to talk about the idea of like our comfort and our desires being secondary, I rarely in and of myself put my comfort and my desires secondary to anything. And I would guess you're probably the same. And so something needs to happen in our lives to make this possible. Something needs to happen in us that allows us to truly follow Jesus in a way that results in us focusing on others. If you're paying close attention, you'll notice that, that as we went through, I kind of slid by a verse. And I want to come back and, and return to it because it's really kind of the, the key to this passage of Scripture. And it's the solution to this problem that it's impossible to truly on focus on others without help. It shows us where our help comes from. And it's verse 17 in Matthew chapter 8. It says, this was to fill, fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. He took our illness and bore our diseases. And this is probably Matthew's translation of, of the Hebrew text of Isaiah that was originally written in Hebrew in that. And I want to read the, the surrounding passages there, the surrounding verses that, that help us know what this verse is talking about. You may recognize some of this uh, when we start into it. Starting in verse 13 of chapter 52, it says this, Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred 
beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. So shall he sprinkle many nations, kings, <coughs> excuse me, shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them they see, and that which they have not heard they understand. Who has believed what they heard from us? And who has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a plant, a young plant, like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief as one from whom men hid their faces. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Verse 4, and here the first part of this is, is the quote that Matthew uses. And he trans Matthew translates it a little differently than my Bible. But it's the same idea. Matthew 4, it says, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken smitten by God and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him, the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his stripes, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray and have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Matthew is reminding us by, by using this quote from Isaiah that the cross is what transforms us into truly following Jesus in a way that brings God's help and existence into our life so that with God's help, we can focus on others in a way that makes an eternal difference. The cross is what does this. And the, the pictures of Jesus entering in and healing people all point us to the realities of the cross. That we are dead or harmed or sick or oppressed or whatever the specific miracle may be. And that by ourselves, we can't do anything to fix it. But because Jesus took our illnesses and bore our diseases, because our sin and our iniquity was placed on him on the cross, we can have life that's empowered by God that allows us to have the same mind, the same attitude to walk just as he walked and to truly focus on others. Jesus transforms us through the cross. Jesus transforms us through the cross. We cannot see the needs and act on them. We cannot put our comforts and our desires secondary unless our hearts have been changed by Jesus Christ. So the, the question is, is first, have you believed? Have you believed this message? Are you truly a follower of Jesus Christ? You know, you may have gone to church. You, you may have been involved with things for a long time. You may think Jesus is a, is a pretty cool guy and that his way of life seems to be all right. But have you truly believed? Meaning you've acknowledged and said, yes, God, I am a sinner. And Jesus paid the penalty for my sins on the cross. And that without him doing that, I would have no hope of a life with you and no hope of, of meaningfully engaging with others in a way that's eternally significant. Have you believed? If not, will you believe today? It's as simple as saying a simple prayer or confession. It's not these words that save you. It's, it's believing with our heart and confessing with our mouth that Jesus is Lord. But to say that, yes, Jesus, you are God and you died to pay the penalty for my sin. I need your forgiveness and I need your work to transform my life. I'm trusting in you alone today to save me from my sins. 
If you've prayed that prayer or said something like that, that means that you are now truly a follower of Jesus Christ. People in Jesus' day followed and maybe went away. They, they checked him out for a little bit, but his true followers came to understand the powerful message of the cross. And Matthew hints at that uh, in, in his gospel. If this is a new message for you or you want to think about it some more, or to take a look at it, we have a, a card, a page on our website. It's always accessible on the front page of our website, and then it's always accessible on whatever page to the menu at the top of the screen, but the Gospel tab. And it goes through this a little bit more in detail, and, and you can contact us if you have questions. You can let us know that you've made this decision, and we would love to hear from you. If you are not yet a true follower of Jesus, I would encourage you today to take that step. For those of us that have made that decision, then there's a question for us. How will we, how will you give and focus on others? What will you do this week? Let's limit it to seven days. Let's not just have some like theoretical, well, I'm going to be more others focused for my life. Great. What in the world does that mean? But how will you this week take a step to see a need and to meet it? Even if it means your comfort becomes secondary and your desires, maybe you don't get to, to see that game or to watch that show or to do that thing that, that you'd want to do. But how will you give and focus on others? Uh, we encourage you each week to, to let us know how you're processing. And I would love to, to pray with you about the decisions that you're making would you answer that question of how you will give and focus on others with our connection card? It's available at our website, branchlife.church, and you can click on that and, and fill it out electronically. The amazing thing about Jesus is that when we are truly his followers, he begins to transform our life. And slowly but surely, we are formed more and more into his image. It's because he's working in us. It's not our own strength that we're doing it all alone, but we can be very encouraged. And I trust that this week you've been encouraged that following Jesus means that we focus on others. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for Jesus. God, thank you that he is our example and he shows us what it is to, to follow you and to do your will. But God, thank you as much or more for the fact that it's Jesus that transforms us and makes us into the type of people that can do these impossible things, like focusing on others, even when everything in us doesn't want to or isn't naturally inclined that way. God, thank you that, that you have grace and forgiveness and allow us to take small steps to become more and more like your son. We pray that each of us this week would take at least one small step towards focusing on others. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. May the Lord bless you. Have a great week. We look forward to engaging with you again soon.